Okay, so let's get started. We just uh, released the NN API endpoint 1.1, but before I will go into uh, showing you what's new, I want to give you a bit of uh, basics about APIs and how to set up the NN API endpoint. And I'll go through a few uh, basic concepts, which I will need to, uh, in order to demonstrate the new functionalities. So I, I, I think uh, most of you are familiar. This is the uh, DNA API endpoint module. After you add it to a page, this is how it looks. And then you can create a new method. And you just give it a name. Let's say um, get user. And then you specify an HTTP method. And this usually is related to what you are trying to do. If you want to do a get, usually you use the HTTP get. But this is just semantics. It doesn't matter really which which of these verbs you use, as long as you are calling on, with the same verb. And then you can specify a list of parameters. Let's say that we want to take a username as input. And then we generate a list of actions that will produce some output. For example, uh, here we could run a SQL query to get uh, the user information. And here we would use the a token to denote the parameter that came in to the API. And the rest is a plain SQL query that just returns all the field and can, we can extract, for example, first name and maybe store it also as first name. And then we can just output it as Let's do a row response. Again, we use this uh, square bracket syntax to denote tokens. So this is a standard syntax you have in DNN for tokens. And here we are referencing the fields. So this is how I create a basic uh, API. And now it will appear in the list of methods. And when I run it, when I execute it, I can input a parameter, for example, host. And when I execute it, it will run the query and bring back something to me, which is the first name. Um, the purpose of doing all this uh, API is uh, you need to expose some data to other applications, to other websites. So this uh, test screen already gives you a jQuery code that invokes this API. But uh, many times you will need to expose this API to applications. And then for that I want to introduce you this testing tool. I'm sure many of you know it. It's called Postman. It's a Chrome uh, add-on. And this basically lets you do HTTP requests. So let's see how we would call this API. Just grab the URL or grab it from here. Put it here. The method is get. And then we need to pass more parameters. And since this is a get method, we can pass the parameters via query string. So just say username equals host. Yeah, so this is how we execute from outside uh, web context. And this is uh, one important thing to understand is that sometimes you have a HTTP context and sometimes you don't have that. So in this example, when I access from a, a mobile application, for example, there will be no data such, such as cookies or currently logged in user or a referrer. So if you designing your API and you know you are lying on those tokens, you should uh, act, you should plan accordingly. So this uh, Postman lets you test as you were a mobile application, for example. So I think it's, uh, that's why it's very useful to test with both. <clears throat> uh, one more thing that I want to, to make a point is uh, the difference between REST APIs and uh, RPC, Remote Processor Call. Um, because API endpoint supports both, but uh, it's not, it's not uh, a setting that you have to declare. It's just the way you design the APIs that make it REST or RPC. So REST API usually is focused on an object. And RPC is usually focused on an action. 
So what I did here actually it's an RPC, it's a remote procedure call. I'm calling a procedure, get user. So it's a it's a it's an action, it's a method on the server that I want to execute. The opposite, the opposite is a um, REST API which is focused on an object. So the object would be user and the method is get and then I would pass the parameter again like I did before with using that. <clears throat> so let's look at these two. So what, the first one is RPC. It, uh, it also has the verb in, uh, in the name. So it's get user. And the second one is REST. It's just an object user. And the fact that I'm doing an HTTP verb method makes it REST. So now if I were to, what, to delete the user, I would create a method, an RPC method called delete user. Yeah? And probably I don't have to make it delete or I, I could also just leave it get. Although that is not recommended for security reasons. But I could make it get delete user and I have the same format. Uh, sorry, with a, with a username parameter. And in contrast, let's look at how we would do it REST. With uh, REST, we would create the same object. The object is still user, but this time use a delete HTTP method. Okay? And the rest is the same. We accept one parameter. So let's look. We have two RPC, which is get user and delete user. So the method, so they describe an action. The name describes an action, and in REST, the name describes the resource, and the HTTP verb describe, describes the action. Uh, from from my experience, uh, they both perform very well, but I think that just uh, makes a point to be consistent. I think in older version of IIS, the delete and the put verbs would be prevented by default. So if you develop for uh, cross um, IIS you should, uh, I think you should always use RPC. Okay. So let's see if there are any questions for now. No question. So this, these are the basics of, uh, of creating an API and I've demonstrated to you the difference between RPC and REST, the HTTP verbs and how we can test this with the context inside the browser or outside the browser with Postman. So now we are ready to move on at what's new in 1.1. Uh, the first uh, major thing that I want to point out is that sometimes, uh, sometime last year we added Azure compatibility and currently we are working on uh, getting the Evoke Prefer badge. If you're not uh, familiar, uh, DNN now has a program to have third party extensions certified to be used with Evoke. And we're working to get DNN API endpoint in there as well. Besides that, we've implemented some major functionalities and uh, we implemented API keys and we implemented the support for JSONP and we implemented an abstract uh, layer called entities and I will demonstrate each one of these individually and show you some example how you use that. And besides that, we, we did uh, other minor adjustments and um, also a lot of bug fixing. This is in the changelog on the website, I will not go to those here. The only thing that I want to highlight here is this line here that uh, says we refactored the actions interface. What this means is now we have a common interface be for actions between all our modules. And we started the process of moving all the add-ons on this shared interface so they can be used on uh, in all action-based products. So I, in the, in the uh, coming months you'll see all the add-ons, like the PDF generator add-on, the PayPal add-on, the authorized domain, the Salesforce add-on, they will work not only with Action 4, but also with API endpoint, Action Grid, and so on. So let's move on to demonstrate one feature at a time. Let me check if there are any questions or chats. No, everything is good. Everything is well understood, I hope. So uh, let me uh, demonstrate this API key. So the purpose of an API key is to uh, want to restrict access to an API or to identify who's making some requests. So to differentiate between requests for uh, logging for auditing purposes, for example. I'll just jump into the demo and show you how we can create an API key, which is simply a unique code. 
and a friendly name. The friendly name is something that you would uh, recognize the API key in logs and uh, also in this list. So let's say that we want to, to give one API key for mobile. Now we go to, let's say, to the get user method, edit it, and we have a section at the bottom for security. And here, uh, the first option has already been there from uh, version 1. You can uh, restrict the domains that access this API. So by default, it's public. The whole world can access it. If you plan to only use it on a current portal, you can you can have this only domain associated with current portal. And what this does, it looks at the portal analysis table, so only allows requests from this port. Or the same thing, you can do it from the entire DNN instance. Or you can restrict it to a domain list as well. So this this already been there. The new piece is the API keys. And here we can restrict to a list and we only have our API keys. So that's all we need to do to secure this API. Now let's look how we would access this API. So if I go in and test it using the jQuery method, uh, let me put some username here, host. You'll notice that this works and I didn't have to put the API key anywhere. This is because um, DNN API endpoint also uh, looks at current user if it's admin or super user it just works it doesn't require the um, API key but now let's go to Postman and try to access this API again this time we get a error saying that the current request is not authorized to invoke this API method so now we need to pass the API key and we have uh, two ways to pass the API keys we can pass the API keys uh, uh, via query string or post or browser cookies. So for, for our get method, we, we could do query string or we could do cookies. Or we could pass it as the HTTP authorization header. So let's try both of them. There is a special name called API key that you have to give to the key. And this um, is uh, documented very well. In, in each section. So for example on API key you'll have this uh, text here, this help text that tells you all these details that I've that I mentioned. So we try to make this uh, this help text really helpful. We, do, we don't uh, clutter with unuseful, unuseful information. So the parameter name here is API key and the API key is this one. So now it gives me back the first name of the username. If I were to go in and change a letter of this API key, I would get again the access denied. <clears throat> Let's look at the other method. So I'll just delete the API key from the query string. And the other method, uh, we can send it via an authorization header. So I open this header section here, and I'm passing the authorization header and putting the API key inside. Send, and I got the same effect. So I have two ways to, to uh, authenticate with the API keys. And I think that's that's all you need to know about the API keys. Uh, that's all we have, at least. It's uh, very basic and just to the point right now. So let's see if there are any questions. If not, I will proceed. Okay, no questions yet. Okay, so let's move on to the next feature, which is JSON P. And this is uh, going back to what I showed to you earlier regarding the cross domain security. So let's look again at those options. So you have here the option to specify the list 
of domains that can access this API. So for example, if I were to change the domain here, allow it only for example.com, I'm not sure if we implement it to restrict also the current domain, but let's check host. No, it still works for current domain. But normally, uh, other domains will not be allowed to access this API. And uh, but then you could still make a mechanism to allow cross-domain requests, and that is called JSONP. JSONP basic is also JSON. So JSON is a format for displaying the data. I will show you that in a bit if you're not familiar. And JSONP is adding is called JSON with padding, and it's adding something around that to make it valid JavaScript. And I will demonstrate this one step at a time because uh, I'm sure it will be uh, a lot easier to understand if I show an example. So let me delete this row response and this time I want to generate a JSON response. So I put a JSON object. And here I will put a property and I will call it a name say, and I will put a value. And here I can use tokens. I can use the first name token again to add this property to the JSON object that's being uh, returned from this API. So let me save this and uh, access this again and let's look how the response looks now. So this is basically JSON. This uh, parenthesis here uh, marks the beginning, this one the end, and this one are the properties and the values that uh, we've exposed. So the thing is uh, you, you cannot call this API from another uh, domain. You cannot make a, Java, a request from JavaScript to, to this, but you can put a script tag with this. You, you can put a script tag and in the uh, uh, attribute of the script tag, let me open a notepad. So you can have like this, script. So you, you can include it like this on, the, on any page. This works cross-domain as well. But the problem with this is that it will return the uh, JSON, which is valid JavaScript, but it's not stored anywhere. So it's not stored in a variable. So this uh, request is uh, basically useless. What JSON padding is doing is uh, providing the caller with the ability to uh, pass a function name which will be reflected back in the response. So the response will, will, uh, will end up something like this. My function passing this object into the function, where the my function is something that you pass to, uh, the caller passes to the API. And I think this is also a uh, good method to to uh, uh, implement some kind of uh, notification system so you know that when uh, the API response comes back your handler will be notified, your function will be notified. Although this mechanism exists in all, in all uh, libraries like jQuery, they will do this. <clears throat> okay, so let's see how we do this in um, API endpoint. So in this uh, get user method there is a option that says allowed JSONP. When we enable this, we can pass a parameter via query string called callback. And in this callback we can give it a function name. Yes. So if we just grab this callback and we append it here and callback equals my function when I execute this, uh, you will not see the response here because Postman figures out it's a JSONP, but if you go to the row re response, uh, actually, mm, let me double check the settings again, maybe I didn't save it here. Okay, save, let's try again. Yeah, 
So this time uh, you can see here uh, in, when it shows the JSON, uh, Postman figures out that it's uh, JSON P, so it doesn't show you the function call. But if you go on row response, you can actually see that it's sending back my function as well. So that's all about JSONP. So basically JSONP is very good to allow cross-domain requests. So if you are developing a public API, um, you can either go with JSON with uh, public access, which the, what, what this uh, does, let me give you a bit of more information. Sorry. What this uh, public a prop, uh, property does, it reflects back a header, this header, with the uh, referrer. So whoever is calling the API, API endpoint reflects back an, a header saying that that domain is allowed. So I think both work to the same effect. Okay, let's see, we have some questions now. So one question is, uh, the API key is unique for all methods. Uh, no, the API keys, like I've showed you before, let me get back. The API keys you define uh, globally. Yeah, so I could add uh, more API keys. The code here is generated uniquely, but you can change it, I think. You can put whatever code you want in there. And then you can uh, use them in methods. So, for example, you can uh, in get user I give access to the mobile, but I could also go to a different method and give access to the same key. It would be overkill to create uh, the API keys for each method. So I can go into the user REST API and do the same thing. Another question, is there a way to encrypt the key? Um, well, the key is already like looks like nothing, so I'm not sure why you'd want to encrypt it. Um, if you are talking about uh, being concerned that somebody might um, uh, intercept the request and see the API key, I think it depends. If you if you do that, you should send the API key through POST and use HTTPS. So if you use HTTPS and send the API key through POST, it will be secure by default. If you pass it to the query string, it will be visible, and if you pass it as a header, again, it will be visible. And uh, the thing is that uh, even if you encrypt it and put it in a query string, for example, it wouldn't matter because somebody could get the encryption and just pass it along, and it will be the same authentication if somebody intercept that. So it would matter if it would make a difference if there was maybe a expiration mechanism, like if the API would exchange a token first, that the token maybe expires or takes into account the caller location and uh, the caller uh, IP, for example, and only works for that IP. That would be a, uh, a solution. So I think, I think there are uh, ways to, to improve security around this, but I don't think encrypting the API key will achieve anything. Okay, I see one more question. Can we query a different database other than the DNN database? Yes, you can. You can do this in uh, all our modules since maybe, I think, one year ago we implemented this feature. So, for example, in the get user, we have the run SQL, and here you have a connection string. And here you can put the connection string as it is, or you can put the name of a connection string that you define in a database. And in, sorry, that you define in web.config file. And if you put the connection string in web.config file, you also have the possibility to specify a different provider, so you can connect uh, to Oracle or other databases as well. But here, if you put it here, it will only work for a SQL client for SQL databases. Okay. Um, 
no more questions so I'll move on to the last major piece that we added and that is the entities so <clears throat> the problem right now is uh, the problem that we had since we, uh, until we implemented the entities is that you cannot create a list of entries here you, you can create a JSON object but you cannot create a list of JSON objects and that makes it uh, very very limiting what you can do with this API and the new functionality that we implemented and maybe I will uh, rename this to get tabs since I probably have more tabs than users so I'm making now an API to search for pages so I want to run a SQL query which will return multiple entries and I want to expose those entries as, um, JSON, as a JSON list <clears throat> so you will notice a new section called entities and here we have an action to load entities from SQL right now it's only possible to load it from SQL but we have it on our roadmap to load from web services as well so now we would uh, run the SQL uh, select all from uh, tabs where tab name like Okay. and then we have to name our entity let's call it page and then we extract some property for this page so let's extract the tab ID column and store it as ID maybe I can also put it lowercase some uh, folks out there prefer JSON to be lowercase which was the original standard I guess and then we want to exp export the tab name and call it name and that will do for now okay. so I'll save this um, one more action that we have here regarding entities is to remove entities so now that we loaded an, uh, some uh, entities maybe we want to to remove some at some point because of some conditions let's say we do a web service request and we get some response and here we could uh, say that we want to restrict pages which uh, let's, and here we can put some criteria let's say we, whose uh, name equals admin we don't want to show the admin page for example and finally we have the response actions which are uh, JSON entity and JSON entity so if we wanted to export only one object we would use JSON entity if we want multiple we would use JSON entity list and here we input the entity name that we want to export and again we can specify some criteria to filter this um, entity list further to what we want to export again the allow JSON P header and we can also have the ability to create more custom headers so this is the basic setup of getting a JSON list out there. Let's test how this works. Oh, so now I'm getting that error. Maybe I didn't say that's why I didn't get it because uh, I think I left it with uh, example.com. <clears throat> it's apparently let me check this again so I have a parameter called search let me get rid of the extra code I have a load entities selected from tabs where tab name like search entity name page tab id tab name json entity list page let's make everything public I'm not sure why this doesn't work let me also try it on um, 
this man. Okay, so here it works. I think there are some leftovers. There may be the API keys or something. So there is some leftover. So I see here it works and I get a list of um, I get a list with all the tabs since um, I didn't filter. But let's add a parameter to search only for uh, host. So now we get host and host settings. Yeah. So this way I exported a list of uh, JSON objects. And I can customize the names and so on. And same I could do for um, for a JSON entity, so if I were to put page here, which is the entity name, this action would only get me, let me read before, would only get me one entity. So now if I execute it, it will always return the first entity no matter how, much, how many are there. So uh, that is the concept about entities. Um, we plan to extend this concept a lot because uh, it makes it easier to operate with large data sets. So what we want to do regarding uh, entities, we want to allow nested entities. Yes, because right now we have, uh, like you saw, we have the uh, name and ID. But what if we want uh, to have a, an address? Yeah, we want to have an address like this, which is a different entity. It has other properties. So this we don't support right now, and it's, we don't support it with these actions. You can still do it, and uh, many of our clients do it with a Razor. Yeah. So they use my tokens to create a Razor script, and then they use a row response and just output that. Uh, that token. Okay, so let, let me get back to what else we plan to do with the entities. So one is the ability to have entity, nested entities like this, which you, you can do with a Razor script, but not, not, not like I did here. But instead, uh, you would just put uh, the token in here, my Razor, my razor script. <coughs> that would be uh, one thing to do it now. Um, other thing we want to do, like, I, like uh, I've told you, we want to load entities from web services and then we want to create actions that can uh, look uh, on uh, entities and perform a set of actions on each entity. So like I did here, I, c I could perform a set of action on each entity. And <clears throat> I think some of the action already do this, like send emails, I think we we modified it at some point to do this. I'm not sure if it's in uh, sharp. I think it's in sharp schedule. I don't think it's in API endpoint yet. <clears throat> but basically, we want to extend this uh, um, entity concept to all the actions. So, for example, you could make a selection of users and uh, execute a grant user action, which would grant permission to all the users. Grant user. So you do a grant user role and it will grant role to all the entities in the list. So this is where we want to be headed with this entities concept. And I think uh, that's all I had. Um, there are a bit more details about entities you'll find in documentation, like we have this token to get the entity count. So before I end, let me see if there are uh, more questions here. No? I will, uh, while, while uh, you think of more questions, I will go over a bit over the roadmap, what we have. Um, and actually it's not a roadmap because we don't plan any release yet. It's just uh, what we have high in our priority list for API endpoint. So the next identity that I've told you. And then we want to format response based on uh, header. So right now you can make an API that always returns JSON. But we would like to, to have the ability for the uh, API uh, creator to define 
a different uh, output based on the accept header. So if somebody calls with accept text XML, we serve an XML object, and if it passes application JSON, we serve a JSON model. So we want to support that as well. <coughs> and then <coughs> again about the entities, and actually we want to take this entities concept to all our modules. So that will be coming in the in the next uh, releases of each module. And then one other idea that we had recently was about the WCF integration. I think that would be really neat to expose the API endpoints also on other protocols than HTTP. I think that would be a, a very neat feature. <coughs> but again, uh, none of these uh, are planned. We just released API, API endpoint 1.1 and uh, we'll connect with you on our forums, collect more feedback and decide where we go from there. I see no questions, only some people thanking for uh, these new functionalities that they uh, have already used in production. So, because you see our release cycle is like we keep implementing uh, features <coughs> which uh, some, somebody needs at some point and then we make a uh, or no official release out of them. So this uh, API piece, for example, has been around I think for six months and the entities, I think four months and so on. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for your time and I wait for you all at the next webinar. I think it will be the Action Grid release uh, in two, two weeks from now. And uh, in Action Grid we'll have some very interesting new features. Thank you again for your time and uh, have a great day, evening, afternoon and so on. Thank you.